Names are very important in any setting. They are what we use to identify so many things in our world. The objects that we possess, the actions that we perform, and of course those nearest and dearest to us. But we also name the data items that we make use of in a program, as well as their data types, their properties, and methods. These names also allow us to associate attributes with them, whether we are talking about their values or their addresses in memory. And these names cannot always be used in all places within a program. The areas of the program where the name is valid is called its scope. We will be discussing this in Lecture 5. For the most part, the earliest programming languages were imperative. This was easy to visualize because imperative languages are abstractions based on the idea of the von Neumann architecture. We have statements in a sequence that perform basic operations, although not necessarily as basic as machine language instructions. Variables are abstractions based on the idea of what we can store in computer memory. As we think about what variables are, we recognize that they have characteristics that we typically call attributes. These will include the scope of the program, where the names mean what we intend them to mean, their lifetime, when they have storage allocated for them, and when they are no longer available, what kind of data will they hold, when will we initialize them and with what values, and with what types of data items are our variables compatible. There are two design issues that we need to address right away. Are the names case sensitive and are special words in the programs reserved or just keywords? Name length requires us to walk a very thin line between their being too short to be meaningful and their being so long that they can become difficult to store, although they will cease to be practical long before their length makes it hard to store them. The length of a name is a design decision because these names need to be stored in the symbol table. This has been handled in many different ways. The original version of BASIC restricted variable names to a single letter or a single letter followed by a single digit. Thankfully this restriction was relaxed in subsequent versions of BASIC. Fortran 4 only allowed identifiers to be six characters long which made it very difficult to create meaningful variable names. Newer versions of Fortran have corrected this shortcoming. Fortran 95 allows up to 31 characters. While this may also seem limiting, it becomes difficult to work with identifiers that are more than 30 characters. The version of C specified in Kernighan and Ritchie's book, The C Programming Language, did not actually restrict the number of characters in an identifier, but it only considered the first eight characters significant. C99 has a much higher number of characters that it considers significant. 63 in an identifier, except for external names, where it only looks at the first 31. C++ has no limit, but the standard allows implementers to impose one. C Sharp, Ada, and Java have no restrictions. There is no limit in how long an identifier can be, and all characters in an identifier are significant. Some languages use special characters, usually non-alphanumeric characters in identifiers, and they can be used for a variety of reasons. BASIC uses a percent sign at the end of an identifier to indicate that it is an integer variable, a dollar sign to indicate a character string. Perl uses special characters to distinguish between different types of variables. Scalar single-valued variables begin with a dollar sign. Regular arrays or indexed arrays begin with an at sign, while associative arrays or hashes begin with a percent sign. Also, please note if you are working with a single array element or a single element of a hash, you precede the variable name with a dollar sign. You would then have the index 
of the array appear afterwards in square brackets, or the hash value appear inside curly braces. PHP also uses dollar signs in front of all variable names. Ruby uses an at sign for instance variables and two at signs for class variables. Case sensitivity is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it gives you a larger range of identifiers to use, but it can be confusing because names with exactly the same spelling are different identifiers because uppercase A and lowercase a are different characters. All the C-based languages, C++, C Sharp, Java, are case sensitive, but that's not necessarily the case in other languages. Fortran, COBOL, BASIC, SQL, and ADA are examples of languages that are case insensitive. The problem with case sensitivity is a little worse in C++, Java, and C Sharp because they have predefined names that are written in mixed case and they use mixed case to identify the different words appearing in an identifier. All languages use special words for their own purposes. They can be used to indicate the type of statement that the user is writing or they can be used to delimit separate clauses within a statement. In many cases, the latter category are called noise words because they do not really serve a purpose beyond delimiting a statement clause. The assignment operator in Fortran and several other languages is an example of this. If the grammar did not require it, we could use a blank space in its place, but it would be less readable. Keywords serve a special purpose in the language, whether they are data types, special variables, or indicating the type of statement that is being written. In Fortran, the keyword real can be a data type, or declared and used as a variable name as well. As you can imagine, that can create a fair amount of confusion. A reserved word is a word that has a special purpose in a language, and for that reason cannot be used as an identifier, nor would you want to. There is a famous example from PL1 where then and else are declared as Boolean variables and manipulated in an if statement. It is extremely confusing and can make it very easy for a student to make an error that then becomes very hard to find. Is there a downside to making keywords reserved? Yes, if there are too many of them. This is the case with COBOL, which has roughly 300 reserved words. For this reason, it is not surprising that so many words like this in Java are special identifiers which can be overridden, and they are not reserved words. Variables in higher level languages are abstractions of a memory cell, the space where we can store the data item in question. The term cell doesn't sound like it is defined clearly, but it means a space in memory where we can store a data item and from which we can fetch it. Variables have six attributes, its name, or how we call it in a higher level language, its address, where in physical memory it is stored, the value or values that it contains, its data type, its lifetime, which typically means when we allocate storage for it and when we deallocate or free its storage, and lastly its scope, in which areas of the program can I access this variable. The first and possibly most important attribute is the variable's name, and not all variables have them. One example that comes to mind is an anonymous object, which is written using a constructor call in Java. Also, it is possible to use the return value of a function call, or the value that a pointer variable points to. The second is address, the location in memory where the value is stored, 
the address normally associated with the variable. But this will not always be the same for several reasons. Most programs use dynamic allocation of memory, where space for local variables is allocated when execution of the subprogram to which they belong begins, and the space is freed when exiting the subprogram. Each time you enter the subprogram, there is no guarantee that the same area of memory is available. For this reason, at different points in time, the address in memory that a variable will use will not be the same. There are situations in real life where people may be known by more than one name, and this can also be true for variable names as well. In both situations, we call these various names aliases. An alias for a variable can be created in a couple of ways. Pointers are a common way of creating aliases, and so are reference variables, where parameter passed to a subprogram is passed by reference and then has its value changed in the subprogram. Another way of creating an alias is through unions in C and C++, where more than one variable is overlaid on the same memory space. In the case of unions, changing one of these variables will change the others. Since they may have the same data type, but more often will not, the effect on the other variables will be difficult to predict. Aliases are harmful because it hurts the readability of the program. A programmer can forget that two identifiers refer to the same one memory location and that changing one changes the other. For this reason, it is generally a bad idea. Value refers to the value stored in a particular location in memory with which the variable is associated. When I use the variable x, I know that I am usually referring to the value of a given data type to which x belongs that is stored at a location associated with x. There are two types of values that you will find in an executable statement, an L value and an R value. The L in L value stands for left. It appears on the left-hand side of an equal sign in an assignment statement. The R in R value stands for right. It appears on the right side of the equal sign in an assignment statement. There are things that you can have on the right side of an assignment statement that are not legal on the left side because the left side needs to reference an address in memory where the result will be stored. This is not the case in an R value, where the only thing that you need to do is ev to evaluate the expression and find the value that will be associated with the L value. For this reason, we recognize that L values must reference the address of a variable, while R values need to reference their value. As we will see in a subsequent lecture, there are three things that define a data type its set of allowable values, the operations that are defined for values in the data type, and if the type is an aggregate type, what are its components? It is possible for different data types to be similar, but not close enough. Integers and floating point values are both numbers, but their ranges are quite different. And if we look at different integer data types, their ranges will distinguish them from each other as will the precision for different floating point types.